Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games of our childhood and try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Nick, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Dean and Tim. Bogey on your six. Reporting for duty. This month, we're taking a look at Wing Commander. In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. So this movie, there was definitely a movie I watched a lot as a kid. Um... This came out in 99, so this was right on the cusp of episode one. Uh, growing up, I played a ton of um, the flight simulator games on computer, especially like, you know, um, X-Wing, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. And those were pretty big staples to my childhood. And amazingly enough, I've never played Wing Commander, but this is pretty much the same game type and genre as those by LucasArts. So this was equally as popular as X-Wing, and even though I never played the games, the movie pretty much made it as close to flying in an X-Wing shooting down TIE Fighters as possible at that point in time in cinema history. So, have you all seen it growing up at all, or any exposure to it? I have only ever heard of it until today. Yeah, I just knew that it came out. Yeah. I, After watching it, I can confirm it's a movie. I rented it to watch for this show, and then as soon as the credits rolled, I bought it. You did not. I did. I own it now. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a glowing review. I'm 100% on board with this. Don't trust me. So when Patty Jenkins announced that she was doing a Rogue One or um, a Rogue Squadron movie for Star Wars... My first initial instinct was basically, so it's just going to be Top Gun meets Wing Commander with Star Wars. And I really hope that's still the case. But this type of movie doesn't seem to happen often because I feel like Top Gun came out and that like every 10 years we get a movie like this. So like Top Gun came out and then Wing Commander and then Stealth. And then I don't remember any movie after that to make any kind of like squadron dogfighting kind of red tails movie. was good was it i was thinking of that one but i didn't include it only because i felt it was more historical well yeah definitely but i did want to see that and that's also by lucas arts or lucas film which this movie like as i was getting into it for the first time all i could think is yeah i would watch if it was just a an entire netflix series of just paladin and the crew of that ship just going around doing missions and doing stuff in space. It's like, I don't need all fancy like Skywalker and all the Jedi and like stuff out of all of that kind of thing. Just give me like a very basic, yep, we're all just people on a ship and we just go do dogfight missions and complete things. I don't want to derail too much and talk just about Star Wars, but honestly, watching Rogue One, that was the best sequence through the whole film was seeing the space battle. They managed to nail it so well and being able to see just, you know, space dogfighting at its prime. That was the epitome of any time you played X-Wing, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, all of those flight sims games from Star Wars. That's what you expected to see. And re-watching this movie, I didn't realize how little dogfighting there was. And I was actually kind of disappointed in that. I mean, because I thought it was a lot yeah. more of a segment in the movie and it's kind of marketed as such. And then you realize that, no, out of like the hour and a half movie, there's maybe 10 minutes of dogfight and that's it. At least Top Gun is so heavy in the dogfighting that they needed to make a plot. It didn't feel overly long to me, at least. So it's like, yeah, the other than the fact that there were maybe, I don't know, like four dogfighting sequences in the movie. I don't remember what took up a majority of the time other than that. Like, granted, it's the drama on the ship, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it was just f- yeah, like it, Prince Jr. getting yelled at, you're a pilgrim? And then that's the next, <laughs> like, 20 minutes of the movie until finally, hey, we got to go fly a plane and do the whole point of the movie. 
<laughs> All right, well, and, when you get back here, I want to yell at you some more. And now yes, meet sir. your wing commander, John Wayne. <laughs> hey, Pilgrim. <laughs> and Dean also had thoughts. Yeah, Dean. No? No thoughts? I actually didn't watch it. I'm watching it in real time once we start, and I'll comment on it. All right, I'll go start. <laughs> I love the way the credits <laughs> happen. Yeah. <laughs> wow, did they change the 20th Century Fox logo for um, for this movie? <laughs> I feel yeah. like this movie happened at a very bad time or a very inopportune time, considering that it was like, as you mentioned, what, a month before Phantom Menace came out, and it happens the same month as The Matrix. I forget what I was watching, and they mentioned on how there's a specific movie that came out that changed special effects from that point forward. Winter. And it was like, no, it was, it was like subsurface scattering over light. That's what changed the special effects from looking like very plastic and not. It didn't have that kind of very Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> yeah, I have to find that documentary or like that quick thing. It might have been um, Corridor Crew that mentioned it, but there was a one specific movie where it wasn't that great but they nailed that specific special effect and that's from that point forward because a lot of the special effects in this reminded me of like small soldiers and how the plot it worked for that movie because they're plastic toys but when you have real life things it just the suspension of disbelief is definitely like you know this is a special well, effect i hear all these reviews like before i watched the movie the first time talking about how terrible all the special effects were in this and watching it, I'm like, for a movie in 1999, I'm like, yeah. it's not bad. Like, the space sequences are fine. Like, everything looks decent as far as that. I like the sets, the inside the cockpits. To me, I know everybody's probably comparing it to the fact that it's like, well, yeah, they look terrible. Because Phantom Menace and The Matrix and all of that. Well, yeah, great. But not all of them are going to be, like, these massive genre-defining films. Like, you, I can't compare every movie that came out in the early 90s to be like... Well, I mean, Jurassic Park was right there. Yeah, great. Not everybody had the money, the crew, and the time as Jurassic Park. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a Lucas budget. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it wouldn't ex be expected to be. It's a, you know... I didn't even think to check who did it. The ill-fated... Not necessarily this was ill-fated, but, you know, the video game movies have a reputation. <laughs> it yeah. Somewhat continues yeah. along with this, but... Yeah. Which I was actually surprised. Um, we'll get into it later. But one of the special effects sequences, it's like, oh, so this was bullet time three weeks before The Matrix came out. So it's not like they would have been copying. Oh, yeah. right. Oh, right. That's right. I didn't even think of that because when I put it in the notes, I, I quipped that, you know, the here's the Matrix style thing. But this came out before it. So everybody watching The Matrix for the first time is like, oh, the, he did the Wing Commander thing. Yeah, right. And I, I think they did the same method, too. They just kind of on they were probably in sound studio B and Matrix yeah. was in A. They peeked <laughs> through the door like, hey, they got this weird like 360 gimbal thing with their cameras. Let's do that for this one quick thing. Uh, sir, we only have 20 cameras, though. OK, give me a 90 degree gimbal thing. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> it like the camera stops and then it just like rotates. But instead of the full way around, it's just like from one shoulder over to the other shoulder and then it stops. I assume yeah. it was just like, a, oh, we heard about this technique and somebody knew somebody who was like on the same production was like, oh, they're doing this. Like, that would be great for the time jump sequence. Yeah. Which I think like it was fun. I think the, the shot itself, I mean, it seemed like that shot was drastically brighter than the rest of everything else. So I don't know if it's just they blew the place up with lights to get all of their rotating cameras in sequence or whatever. But it's like all of a sudden it goes from five up to a 10 and then it goes back down to a five as soon as that's done. Paladin is definitely the coolest part of this movie. I think. Oh yeah. I would watch an entire series. That's just him being him. The French sharpshooter, which I guess there was some not backlash, but there was some disappointment because I guess the, character in the original games um was like some other blonde dude and then he got replaced in the games by john reese davies and then all of a sudden the character pops up in this and now all of a sudden he's like a grizzled frenchman and everybody's like that's not the paladin we know 
I'm like, do you know Paladin? Because it's the third guy. Oh, no. They, How dare they alter the source material for a new medium for the same thing that they're filming? Oh, no. Well, also the fact that it's like, how dare they change it? You know, Chris Roberts, the director and creator of the game. Yeah, I thought that was really... I didn't Wait, realize. What? Yeah, so like... I'm going to read this whole thing uh, just to get it out of the way. Um, so the movie blasted into theaters March 12th, 99. Um, this Top Gun meets Star Trek film starts um, Freddie Prince Jr., Matthew Lillard, Saffron Burroughs, and directed by Chris Roberts. So I didn't know this until looking up the IMDb for the directing credits and all that. Um, he basically wrote Wing Commander, the video game. He did like the first, second, and third game, and then Icing on the Cake, which I didn't know, and watching this makes so much more sense. He's also currently working on Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Uh, releasing to theaters in 2076. Yeah. But um, like the in the very beginning of the movie with the asteroid base that the Kill Rathi destroy, that looks exactly like a base that's currently in Star Citizen. So then when I saw that, I'm like, holy shit, I never made the connection for the two and i thought it was just i mean it's a super popular you know space sim now that it could have just taken references from this and that but i didn't realize that the guy actually worked on the thing i thought that was really cool yeah because i guess he created the original games and then he had wanted to do a movie and then once the rights finally became available for like film rights he got it from the company to do the movie himself good for him that he he tried he it was nice that (laughs) Whenever we watch this stuff, it's like, are you even a fan of the content that you're making? And in this case, he is the creator of she the content. She is the content. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't canon. I am the canon. Yeah, for real. I wonder if on set he had people refer to him as Wing Commander. Possibly. So the biggest thing with this whole movie is that with a budget of about $30 million, it was only able to gain a third of that at the box office. And that is uh, yeah, probably geez. good reason... Why we've never seen another Wing Commander movie ever since. I mean, the fact that it released against Baby Geniuses and got shellacked by about $16 million <laughs> is painful. Baby Geniuses. Yeah. Just the first one, not, it, just, not the just sequel. Just the first at one. Not, at least not the sequel, okay. I mean, in its defense, um, Baby Geniuses and Wing Commander both couldn't stand up to the Matrix. So my question is, why Wing Commander? Like, what what against any other game like i didn't think it was that hugely popular maybe i'm just wrong because it wasn't my wheelhouse but i just wonder why wing commander got a green light for the big screen like was it because i don't know star wars was in development and somebody was like we need a space movie like star wars is going on development let's because studios do that they hear something's in development they're like all right what what that what probably space had property a, do we have? Like, let's get it going. That probably had a hand in it. Because I know Alien wasn't made because for the longest time, and then once Star Wars hit at the box office, the studio was like, we need more space <clears> stuff. <throat> what do you got? And he's, one guy's like, I got this thing called Dark Star. And like, all right, let me read that. Change it to Alien, get that weird Swiss guy on the line, and get him to design the stuff. <laughs> and that's pretty much how the whole thing went. Hi, but, weird Swiss guy. What do you need? Yeah. So Insert Swiss accent. Please, that's my father. Call me weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, seen as he was the creator and Wing Commander, I assume, like, as a game franchise was doing really well, it was probably, okay, so you already have the rights. You're the creator behind it. That's already popular. That might be a pretty bankable thing for us to be able to kind of lean into that if that's the case. Yeah. Which I appreciate, like, as you said, it, so many of these movies we're watching and ones that we'll eventually probably cover, like Street Fighter and whatnot, or movies where people direct it where it's, yeah, I'm either never heard of it or I'm actively not a fan, J.J. Abrams, of whatever the thing (laughs) is, that to have, like, Chris Roberts doing this, where it's like, no, it's a passion project. Like, he wants to do this. He spent money to get the rights just so he can do this project. Win or lose, I think it's fun. I think his biggest problem making the movie was just video games aside he only could fit everything he wanted to in a single movie and that's it 
He probably had ideas to stretch it out further, but he just he couldn't. And making a television show based on that at that point in time in you know cinematic history, they no one would have greenlit a TV show. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. If like that this... would have been made today, it probably could have because I don't see it needing the same budget as like Halo. But between all the Star Wars TV shows that they're making. I mean, it's not fair because the biggest, most like richest company in the world is making these. But, um, you know, Lord of the Rings is getting its own show. Um, uh, what's that? Uh, Halo got its own show finally. And a lot of studios are starting to step up to some of the more expensive risks. But some of those uh, stories just can't be told in a movie format. You need some kind of like structured television series in like a 10, 10 hours, not two. Well, it's yeah. like we talked about on the last rule of thirds with like the Warcraft movie. Yeah. Um, and like, that's a whole story that does not fit into like a two hour time span and trying to do it just ends up coming out slapdashed or overly simplified. Yep. I think game of Thrones really helped. And it really opened the eyes to a lot of studios realizing that they can adapt some of these properties into a television show and it will work because before Game of Thrones, I really can't think of too many that would have was willing to take that risk. And especially over the last, like, I'd say 15, 10, 10, 15 years, you really see that it's a money machine working them, you know, working the gears this whole time. And it's not just like, oh, let's do this as a passion project. They'll never approve it anymore. Now it's. We need something big that's going to give us money. Let's greenlight Halo. Yeah. As as popular as Halo has been, they would never have made a television show based on Halo after Halo 2. It took them, what, six, seven Which, Halos? Before that would have been did. the time to do it. <laughs> yeah, for real. But the technology wasn't there. And they yeah. tried. I think they had rumors of them doing a Halo TV show even back then or a Halo movie. It's know. the perfect time for nostalgia for that kind of stuff. I mean... It, the industry is driven by money, so when they see people that are going to movies or watching TV, or they're in charge of doing of uh, subscribing to channels, it's like, yeah, the, we're gonna get these fans because they grew up with it. Like they're gonna look, they're gonna pay for it no matter what because it's their nostalgia. Like nostalgia is huge I right mean, now. Honestly, uh, it's probably a case of they just analyze what age group is watching the most, what age group has the most dispensable income track back a few years to figure out what was popular when they were a kid great buy up those properties right yeah i'm sure there's tens and tens of <laughs> properties that we don't even know that they yeah. have in the like i'm the waiting for right like a or... an amazon prime crash bandicoot show or something we'll have Fortnite in 10 years that'll be some kind of <laughs> some yeah, I'm kind sure. of series i'm sure the shrek reboot will come by at that point <laughs> <laughs> I like Shrek growing up, but I didn't realize it is Shrek's loved a good movie. by the generation after us. Holy shit. Really? Well, out of like out of nowhere, just Shrek came out like fucking hard when it came to all the different memes and stuff that's currently available. And he's just a super, <laughs> super strong presence. Like these aren't millennials making these memes. And then I, once I realized like it's Gen Z and all the other people after them that are because they grew up with it as a kid movie, whereas we watched it. We were pretty old once Shrek like teenagers, came Teenagers, yeah. Yeah. So we got all of the jokes, which was cool, but they watched it as kids, so they got to enjoy it a lot longer than we did. Yeah. Also, a lot of these kids are ones whose parents grew up on these and now are sharing it with them. So it's like, yeah, this is a movie you watch from childhood on up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Dean, do you know the other writing credit for the writer of this movie? I didn't get a chance to look at the IMDb on this one. So I, I'm sure it's going to be a link to something I should know. So Kevin Droney only did one other movie that I recognize. And it's about this tournament where all these people come together. And then this one guy steals all their souls. We might have done an episode on it. It's Mortal Kombat. Bloodsport? Oh, I thought <laughs> you were going to say Bloodsport. How else do you think Sean claude Van Damme stays so young? <laughs> uh, he was French. Paladin's French. The muscles from Brussels. Seeing a connection. Seeing a connection here. Um. I mean, popular '90s video game movie like Runaway Hit 
video game movie, call up the same writer. I, I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because that came out in, what, 93? 95. 95. Oh, so yeah, it was like a four-year gap. And then this. I mean, Mortal Kombat hits. Yeah, I'm sure he was probably in talks soon after that became a hit. He's like, all right, what else... What else can he write for us? And this only <laughs> well, we came wa- out four years later. We want so. you for Wing Commander. Well, I could do it, but I'm going to need four years to work on this script. <laughs> We're I'm okay with Matt that because we know it's going to be worth it. I'm thinking Matt Lillard and Freddie Prince, but they're not the right age yet. We need to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I met this little kid on the way into uh, the Mortal Kombat screening. And I said, you know what, kid? One of these days you're going to be an actor and I'm going to cast you in Wing Commander. But only if you could have a friend who also is an actor. Speaking of those two, like, didn't haven't they made like seven or eight movies together? Like five, five. Okay, it yeah, wasn't that off. Yeah, because including were, the Scooby Doo's or well, the Scooby yeah. Doo's, she's all that. Uh, Summer Catch, um, and this, and this. Gotcha. I mean, I feel like in the multiverse, but, there's a universe where. Matthew Lillard and Freddie Prinze Jr. made like 50 films together and are still doing it now. And it's like, oh, the that growing up, this was this was the first like bromance duo. And I still love the five of those movies like Summer Catch. I'm a baseball guy. So that movie really, even though it was a rom-com, I watched it for them because they were hilarious through the whole movie. I loved it. Yeah, they're fun together. I like them both in this. I mean, I'm a huge Matthew Lillard fan. Especially mm. like '90s Matthew Lillard, because this was, I think, the the month before SLC Punk came out. Um, I, I rewatched that movie recently. That was it's good. A lot tougher to watch as an adult. <laughs> not a bad. Well, it, not that I didn't like it, but just I understood it more, and it had more of an impact as an adult versus watching it as like a late teen. Yeah, I never saw that one. It's, it's weird uh, to watch. We'll be covering I, eventually another Matthew Lillard movie when I get to do Hackers. Scooby Doo. Oh, you're going to see Scream. Um, well, that's your other show. That's your other show. That's my other show. Don't watch. Don't open this podcast. Uh, oh no! Or listen to, listen to it. Listen to it. Don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a visual medium. <laughs> um, I didn't really care for Freddie Prince in this. I don't think he like. I don't know. I don't think he brought anything that somebody else couldn't have done the same or better. I blame the writing. Personally. Yeah. He wasn't set up for greatness, so... No, I mean, that's definitely true. He uh, just felt bad. The whole movie is just, you're a pilgrim? Yeah? I don't know why (laughs) you're upset? And I don't know what any of this means? So I keep wearing this cross, but I keep getting yelled at for it? We don't want pilgrims on this ship. Well, my mother was a pilgrim. I'm not. Well, you're just a pilgrim. Well, my father was Confederate or whatever it was. Confederation. Confederate. Confederate. <laughs> uh, we take it back. We don't want you on the ship more. Might as well have been. I mean, the way they talk about it. Um, Matthew Lillard, though, I thought, I mean, he was way over the top in this, but I think it was needed and it worked. I mean, I think that was 90s Matthew Lillard for the most part. Part. Yeah, this right. was the same I mean, Matthew Lillard as like Scream and a step under Matthew Lillard from Hackers. Scream is what I was like. I haven't seen that in a while, so I don't know how intense he was in that as far as his wacky I self. Mean, this but. is clearly like his most likable of those three movies as terms of a character. Just right. because he's like obnoxious, but not too obnoxious. He stands I mean, he out the as most Scooby Doo for the most. Yeah. He had the most emotional scene in the movie, which I think was a super was a good contrast to the rest of his performance in the movie. I mean, yeah. even if it was pulled it off, kind of a dumb character move, but we'll get to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mean his? You mean him like unnecessarily doing shit? Yeah. Yeah. The arrogant prick. Yeah. It, a- yes. Given what just. Saying what he had to do there was, I thought, worked. I mean, it's essentially job, somebody but... throwing a knife in the air and standing under it, and then eventually they die, and you're like, no. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, they. Yeah, kinda, we got this they... mission in the bag. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go fuck around a little bit. He does it a few times through the movie. I'm surprised he didn't get grounded after the first stupid attempt. But all right. Yeah, they seem so to let's... play fast and loose with management on that ship. 
Oh, I I rip into him <laughs> in my notes because that's just no. So our movie starts with a recording of JFK talking about his pledge to get to the moon, not because it's easy, because it's hard. That kind of like speech is just you know it's hard. amping up the possibility of space exploration. I did like the intro on how it kind of. I feel the intro gave the wrong exposition because it showed like humanity's progress to charting the stars and then that's it. It didn't do anything else afterward when for a good half hour of the movie you're introduced to a a war that already happened and there's prejudice and you don't understand why that prejudice is there. And it took way too long for the movie to explain it's- why. It's like they didn't explain what the pilgrims were up until a point where they did, and then they explained it four times, like in succession. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I did like the the radio broadcasts of like, okay, so you have a real radio broadcast, and then like a slightly future one, and then a more future one. It's like, okay, so we're getting an exposition dump without it being obvious. It's keeping in line with the whole radio thing. Yeah. I li- I, and I liked it too. It's like, oh, cool. All right. So the pilgrims are the ones that explored the galaxy they were able or i don't know how far they got but they they explored space they charted all of the different like hyperspace lanes i you know use star wars terminology because i don't care um you know they they found hyperspace lanes that they can get from like one point to another easily without crashing into a star bouncing too close to a supernova supernova that kind of shit and i thought that was a cool kind of like you said exposition on how they set that up and uh, at the very end of it, they like, oh, we discovered something and it's a another race of beings called the Kilrathi and they're hostile with no signs of diplomacy. And and that's just kind of where the intro leaves off at. But with all the other talks of pilgrimage or the pilgrims through the next 45 minutes of the movie, I really wish they at least explained what was going on with that war. Yeah. Because I, I know they get into the whole thing of like, oh, they started thinking they were better then they thought they were gods. It's like, OK, but then like at what point, like you didn't mention if they started a war or if you guys just kind of got fed up with it and were like, we're going to go to war with you. Yeah. And they don't explain that until way too late in the film. Because yeah, the whole time it's it. just the pilgrims, they, they made star charts that that's great. Why are they an enemy, an enemy at this point? And I'm assuming the pilgrims fought them because if they fought the pilgrims and then wiped out the pilgrims, it's kind of awkward to then be like, we don't want a pilgrim on this ship. Well, then you guys seem doubly bad. If you started a war, won the war, and you're going to kick Freddie Prince off this ship. Yeah. I just want to know how genetics changed humans over like 600 years. Oh, they say being in space kind of fucks with you physically. But I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it Presumably, they're just humans who somehow could just super compute in their head. Star yeah, they're, jumps. Just, they're just good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird... I, is that pulled from the game, that idea of pilgrims and regular... Quote, None of us have humans? played it. Nope. Okay. No idea. Didn't do the research either. <laughs> I'm taking uh, the a weird movie point blank for what it is, what it's given us, and that's it. So, Wing Commander fans, please leave a... Uh, comment on wherever it is we post this on if actually i think i read something about the pilgrims not even being in the game that it was something worse. for the movie yeah that's a that's weird because <laughs> so it's bad. like it's it feels ham-fisted and it's like they could have had a different device to give freddie prince adversity you know it's what one, i mean it's one thing to like make a warcraft movie and never mention thrall or arthas but it's a whole different story to do a warcraft movie and then introduce like master Jedi? chief through the halfway through yeah <laughs> Like, who's this guy? Oh, he's going to help us. He's the new guardian of the Azeroth. What's his name? Master Chief. And is, he walks in with his green armor and shit. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking it's like, oh, I love the Call of Duty series. It's finally coming to like a, a movie. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, the enemy contingency. It's led by Darth Maul. What? <laughs> That's a thing now. The insurgents have Jedi. Or, it sorry, purely Sith. exists. <laughs> It purely exists just to give him a why can he jump without a supercomputer and B we need something for drama for his character for the rest of the movie. And it was a weird decision. So the camera tilts down into an asteroid field 
no longer an intro with exposition and we see an asteroid base i thought was cool this is the shot that i'm like that's 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 from star citizen because i there was a specific I, I played the game i like it um there's an asteroid base in star citizen that's very similar to this and even the same way that you kind of would have to land and stuff i thought that was a cool kind of callback to it uh, and we discover this film takes place in the year 2654 so we got we got some time before we get to that point. Um, camera cuts inside. We see one of the air traffic controllers step away from his screen just long enough to miss an entire invasion fleet of Kilrathi bombers. <laughs> Kilrathi, by the way, are the enemy. <laughs> Ain't that um, just the way? The enemy people that uh, the bad guys, the bad cats, have you. Um, the an entire invasion fleet of Kilrathi bombers attack the asteroid field base. And it's kind of like Pearl Harbor. They're just wiping out all the big ships that are docked. Uh, camera cuts from surveillance footage to those in the air traffic control room. Kilrathi troopers are storming that base. And the commander in there realizes what they're trying to do and orders something to destroy something called a NAVCOM AI. As the viewer, we have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Uh, the personnel tries to unlock the device. It's like this little black battery looking box thing behind like uh, like plate glass. They try to it's open it up. Yeah, the muck diver. There we go. Which, so they try to self-destruct the device because they're like, it can't fall into their hands. And then the self-destruct fails. So then he takes a rifle and starts blasting the glass and it doesn't break. And then he beats the glass and it doesn't break. At this point, if you own this ship and you can't get in there, I wouldn't be worried about them getting it. Well, I mean, it's like D&D, though, that, yeah, right now they're rolling to see if they can crack open the room. But if they kill everyone in that room, they can just take a 20. <laughs> did they did they didn't say why they couldn't get in that room, right? I understand it's a huge security thing, but I feel like you'd want to get in there somehow if you really needed well, to. Well, there was only one guy who had the key and he was out. Oh, okay. he's probably in the bathroom. Oh, that's still. right. That's yeah. right. That's right. He was in the shitter. He was furiously running back, pants around his ankles. <laughs> so I oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so the commanding officer realizes like the whole futility of the situation, and he sends out a warning call to command, and that uh, the Kilrathi are after their NAVCOM. And at this point, that's when the control room doors blast open. And then we cut over to our beloved friend, David Warner, who in this case now plays Professor. Admiral Tolwyn. His crew is watching the distress call and realize they kill Rathi's strategy. So apparently they can't hyperspace jump directly to Earth's solar system, and they need the coordinates from this Navi computer in order for them to be able to do that. So Tolwyn analyzes their attack pattern and they see a danger. And uh, if they succeed, they would have at least two hours of time to attack without the Earth fleet to defend themselves just because of the way that Earth's fleet is currently set up. So that's two hours of unprovoked, undefended attack. Big old shit moment. <laughs> that whole timeline kind of confused me, I'll be, I'll be honest. The worst timeline is at the very end of the movie, and I'll go over that. <laughs> and also, they were very like into giving specific times on things. Cause it's like, well, they were eliminated 12.5 hours ago. And then like later he'll land and it's like, where did you get this message? Well, from this, well, what happened to them then they got destroyed at this point, 17 hours ago. And it's like, okay, so why are we keeping that much track of the specific times in terms of this, unless they had a timeline in mind. So this whole movie takes place over the span of 24 hours. Or 24 hours after like they jump. 40 hours or something. Yeah, because, I mean, they definitely, f I think they, like, slept on the ship. So it had to have been longer. But they made it seem like it was 48 hours in the beginning. Because mm. didn't they say something like, oh, that that route would be 47 hours or, like, that route would be 36 hours. So it's it was like, like once they had the NAVCOM, it's like, this is probably how long it's going to take. Oh, to once they, oh, okay. Saul, yeah. But after that, I'm like, wait, how long did it actually take? That's why it was confusing. And and what time did they get there to Earth? And I don't know. Yeah, because then they have two free hours. It's like the Toys R Us challenge of murder. It just said two hours on the clock. <laughs> also, David Warner brings like a class and distinction to any script. They were wise not to put him 
as one of the main characters, because if he was on the other ship, I think he would have done a better job. And the movie might have been carried a bit more. I don't know. I think um, Tagger and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jürgen Pruchnow or whatever. Um, oh, Paul Gerald, the other like commander. I he was think an both asshole. Them, he was an asshole, but I think both of them like were good. Yeah. No, they were. We have we have two. Our our web of movies continues to weave here with Harry and the Hendersons and Secret of the Ooze. Because of David Warner? David Warner for Secret of the Ooze. And then what's his name is Jacques Lafleur, the hunter, the other commander. That's where I recognized him. Oh, from. who Tagger? Jacques Lafleur. No, he was the other uh commander. He's like the actual captain of the ship. Yeah. Oh Sansky. The, the, yes. That's Jacques oh. Lafleur. Oh. That's all. Yeah, I thought I recognized him. <laughs> There's our connections. Still in the same outfit. Plus the writer of Mortal Kombat. Yeah, that's just... Flannel yeah. suspenders and a beanie hat on the deck <laughs> of the ship. <laughs> I'm hot on the trail of the Kilathi. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, Blair even... Like, Freddie Prince Jr. Blair even asks David Warner, like, Why are you choosing me? I knew your father. He was a good man. It's like, I mean, I wouldn't just do it because, hey, like... You and your, me and your dad were buddies. Taggart seems to have known his stuff more at the time. Maybe leave the disc with Taggart. I would assume it's the Pilgrim connection. He's like, I know you got Pilgrim blood and I know they're good at this shit. (laughs) I knew you were a filthy Pilgrim. (laughs) Take my disc. What he really means is, I knew your mother. (laughs) (laughs) She's, she's I mean, probably not like biblically. (laughs) well it's a like it's a double thing so by saying i knew your father it means that's the confederate side of him saying that and then by saying like you're a pilgrim i trust you it's because he kind of was more assigning with the mom i knew your mother weird thing to say but okay continue (laughs) this is actually very intimately (laughs) lafleur's So this is where we actually get to meet Freddie Prince Jr. for the first time, playing uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Blair and Matthew Lillard as Lieutenant Todd Marshall. I like how everybody has a call sign in this movie, but they only ever refer to their call signs like maybe twice. Matthew Lillard is the only one they refer to him like a couple times. They do. they, They don't. Call signs are more for when you're actually flying. And I noticed they use it more when they are flying. But when they're on the ship, there's no reason for it. Like uh, like walking around on the ship. It, I, I I took it as... It, well, it's funny because Freddie Prince Jr. is in the show too. But in Rebels, they had call signs, but they only ever use them when on mission because if anyone overheard the radio broadcast and the transmissions, they didn't have to worry about like, oh, they know my real name is Kanan. They just know me as like Spectre 1 sort of thing. Yeah. And I took it as that. He doesn't even get his um, call sign until quite a bit later because i marked him down as maniac here but he's not maniac just yet let's see so lillard um tells prince to go to the bridge as they just received a transmission from enderball talwin and this is where he is assigned the mission to deliver the encrypted message to the tiger claw and of course the admiral served with prince's father in the pilgrim war so this uh fun little sequence here while in route prince visits the captain of the ship um uh, the prince informs them that their journey has started and seeing that the captain, uh, James Taggart, played by uh, Checky Cario, is poring over old star charts and maps. I hate MacGuffins like this and just like, hey, look at this. Um, Blair comments that, you know, hey, those are really old maps and stuff. And Taggart's like, yes, of course, these were the first star charts ever. Ma- I can't do a French accent. Uh, the first star charts ever made, especially by the ones in relation to the cross that the that Prince wears. But, or rather, let me rephrase that. Especially um, old, and they're made by the same people that, you know, bear the same cross that you do kind of thing. And that's when Prince looks down at his cross, which I think looks a lot more like Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, than an actual like cross or crucifix. Yeah, it almost reminded me of like the medallion that William Sadler carries in uh, T- Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight. 
it's like that weird kind of looks religious. Well, I mean, it's a cross, but like it, like future religious. Is it not meant for shanking? It looks like it could he kill He pulls something oh, and absolutely. like a blade comes out. I was expecting <laughs> yeah. him to use that at the end of the movie. No wonder why people hated the pilgrims. That was like a plant that didn't play, didn't pay off. It's like, oh, this has well, I mean, a blade on it. Their religious relic is a freaking weapon. I mean, that's end of the movie. Everything's done, and all of a sudden, it like goes off by itself. You just hear him do ah, and then the credits start. My liver. So here, Taggart explains the pilgrim's history, which we already knew, but it's still vague. Because <laughs> he, he, he talks about like all oh, the pilgrims and no quasar has been charted since their defeat. Okay, by by who, when, why? By us, of course. But of course, the whole segment of of exposition is cut out because that's when the ship begins to tilt, and Taggart rushes to the bridge while kicking Lillard out of the ship or the the you know. <laughs> the, <laughs> he should have. He should have. Well, kick him out of the captain's Whoa, chair. Man. <laughs> Taggart sees that um, Maniac altered the trajectory just enough to put, bu- uh, just enough to like mess up their approach into a nearby gravity well. Yeah. And the ship begins to buckle under the immense gravitational forces, making them, of course, lose their navic computer at the same time. Uh, Taggart rushes to fix it. But Prince starts typing away like a madman into a console, calculating the warp jump into the computer without the assistance of the computer's AI to help. And the thing that gets me the most about this is that he plays dumb. That he doesn't know why it worked when the entire time he's literally just staring at the screen and just constantly (laughs) typing away. And then it's like after the end of it, it's like, we wait, we made it. Dude, what were you doing on that keyboard? (laughs) <laughs> Pan said his <laughs> eyes are rolled back into his head. He's just bla- I just like out what happened. <laughs> Does he have the shining or Blair, what? I never knew you knew Latin. What? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> But yeah, so Lillard wants to get there faster and he's like, Yeah, there's no reason for us to like go at a snail's pace and increase his engines. Cause that's what they kind of set up here. Um which kind of pays off later of the uh, with like our mass or whatever it is, us increasing the speed. It wants to pull us in if we enter it kind of at that pace. So we need to go in at the right trajectory at the right speed. Which right. I think is still stupid, though, because when you're doing advanced ship flight at that point in time, I mean, none of the the space flight makes sense because when you're doing Star Wars like dogfights in space, that's not how space works. So once you kick that realm of reality out and you're doing space physics instead, that's from Star Wars or Star Trek or any of those. They should know that I go fast into black hole, no getting out afterward, you know, like it's just <laughs> you're chasing a guy into a fucking quasar. I'm pretty sure their systems will also say the same thing. Hey. There's a black hole in front of you. You might want to like turn around at this point, but no, they're gonna they're gonna send a, f- a freaking like U.S. Um, aircraft carrier with all of the guns focused on like a little dinghy with a, a you know a motor engine. Like no, <laughs> we gotta kill this one guy. Meanwhile, there's a massive like sinkhole that's just spinning off in the distance. Like how do you not how do you not see this? <laughs> Whatever. If only we could time travel. Uh, that's the only Talk thing that Roberts. was missing. They go through, they go through the quasar, and they come out next to the event horizon. <laughs> Fuck! You just see Matthew McConaughey just banging on the window. No, no. <laughs> he was my ghost. <laughs> so they make the jump, yeah, and the captain congratulates him on being able to do what the computer could never do in such a short time. All the while, Blair just staring at the screen like a drunken idiot. Just, which is very strange to hear, but... Yeah. Which means now, pilgrims. we must use your brain as the ship's computer. <laughs> what? Cronenberg. Cronenberg <laughs> takes over as director. He takes out, like, the bone saw. <laughs> Reanimator is just off screen. Yeah, so it's they, like Tammy they... the T-Rex, except Freddie Prinze Jr. as the ship AI. Where so are we they going fly... now? They fly the ship 
um, on. They made the jump, and now they they finally arrived to the Tiger Claw, and that's the big aircraft carrier in, in space. Um, Blair drops off the encrypted transmission before leaving with some racism or prejudice. Anyway, <laughs> a lot of stupid back and forth stuff. You're a pilgrim, and this is the first, the first segment where just the utter mention of the word pilgrim really, really gets these guys. Jimmy's in a twist. <laughs> You're a pilgrim. Throw him out the airlock. But I have a message. So, Take the message. Then throw him out the airlock. Yeah, so it's not heavily inferred in the intro of the movie, but there is a lot of leftover hatred for the Pilgrims after that war concluded. And at this time, we have no idea who the Pilgrims are, except they're just the first people to explore the galaxy. Which he gives Sansky the message um, about all of this. And it's like, oh, where did you get this? Um, How do you know? Like, we should contact the Pegasus. And he's like, oh, the Pegasus is destroyed. Sansky, like, doesn't bat an eyelash. It's just like, hmm. Right. Well, Pilgrim and life. then he just he just moves right <laughs> out to the next thing. It's like, okay, I guess no love lost for the Pegasus. <laughs> the captain slept with my wife. <laughs> Either that, I mean, I don't know everybody that works in my job. It might be a case of he's trying to like mentally run through his head of like Pegasus, Pegasus, Pegasus. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. I got nothing. Yeah, it's a good thing he didn't lead with the whole I'm a pilgrim thing, because I don't think he would have believed any of that. <laughs> Pegasus is dead? No. It's just, uh, I'm a pilgrim, just cuts to him outside the airlock, like, choking. <laughs> <laughs> it just slowly pans in, he's still holding the thing in his hand. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Kilrathi just, just storm mother. Earth. <laughs> Bum, bum, they bum, run up to da- <laughs> They run up to David Warner. We probably should have sent it with a pilgrim kid. <laughs> he served with my father. <laughs> Airlock cuts. So Blair heads down after dropping off the message uh, to meet up with <clears throat> Maniac on the flight deck, and they see the ship that they're flying, the rapiers, which seem to be a. I like the ship design. Throughout the whole movie, I thought all the ships looked really cool, especially the Starfighters. And then these, I guess, are just a bit more beat up compared to their typical standards. But um, Blair finds his ship, or at least one that's not assigned to anybody. Um, he climbs in trying to familiarize himself with what's, you know, that specific ship. And that's where we see a woman come up and she starts kind of drilling him through different scenarios of dogfighting combat. This is one of the few times where you see uh, Freddie Prince Jr. kind of act kind of brazen and like he's arrogant. He's a bit cocky. Yeah, but he's quickly humbled when he realizes this grease monkey that he's talking to is actually his commanding officer. Lieutenant Commander Devereaux, played by Saffron Burroughs. I actually always had a crush on her. And she didn't. Well, she wasn't in a lot of movies. It was Deep this Blue and Deep Blue Sea and that's it. <laughs> that's, that's all the I only, remember. Like, yeah. only I know two. she popped up in like Troy and a couple other things. But like yeah. the Deep oh, Blue right. Sea is the one I always think of. Yep. Yeah. She looked good in Deep Also, Blue she gets to see I the title see of the movie. She's like, oh, well, I'm your wing commander. Roll credits. <laughs> we never find out what... Nope. Nope. Join it's us next time for Wing Commander 2. <laughs> March of the Pilgrims. <laughs> so So he, he quickly climbs out of the ship and he tries to apologize before, like... Maniac comes up to try to de-escalate the whole situation. That's where he gives her like their marching orders. So then after it just cuts and then we see them walking into the mess hall to meet the other pilots. But when they start to walk in, we move over to the Admiral. He's now actually watching the encrypted message and playing X-Wing and TIE Fighter. This whole segment sequence reminded me exactly of how the briefings were set up in the X-Wing games. Yeah. But it shows here the humans know that the Kilrathi battle group possibly has the means to warp right into Soul Sector, which is just our home solar system. And even though the necessary fleets have all been alerted and they are mobilizing to defend, they may not just get to that warp point in time. And um, because of that, they want to have the Tiger Claw, which is the closest ship currently to the battle group. Um, just go over there, scout out what you can, and 
push comes to shove, just do what you can to bias as much time as possible. Because, I mean, two hours seems like really, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but. <laughs> Until you watch Wing Commander. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I enjoyed it. It was just right there. You had to. I understand. You had to. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> so the prejudice against the pilgrims are still putting command outside their comfort zone. Uh, they have suspicions about the source of this message and how it got to them. And I just think it's a really fucked up kind of you're literally given you, your home base is about to be attacked. And they're like, no, this is this is like pilgrim spy type of stuff. Like they they don't all, they believe it, but they're they're Incredulous. they have their doubts. Yeah. Which is really messed up. So we cut back over to the mess hall where we see Maniac is watching Lieutenant Rosie play Rose, Rosie. I didn't know. Uh, Rosie was... Forbes. Okay. Lieutenant Forbes uh, play chess. He offers his own two cents to score her the win. And here we discover how the squadron treats their fallen brothers and sisters. Uh, Which. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to continue. Oh, I was going to say. I like how Matthew Lillard, like Maniac, tells Blair how, oh, like, I'll show you how to make friends here. And he walks in and he says how, like, oh, you're talking to the second best pilot in the Academy. And he's talking a big game and the other guy steps up to him. And normally you would think that it's like, oh, he's going to be like macho. It's going to be a confrontation. And then it just turns into, well, you have two options. You can try to kick my ass. Or, and then he just shares scotch with him and then shares it with everybody. And it's like, oh, okay. So, like, he's not he's here to, like, friend. show off. It's like, nah, I'm everyone's buddy. Hmm. They had us in the first half, not going to lie. <laughs> and then um. the guy's drinking his scotch. He just <laughs> stabs him with a little cross thing. <laughs> the old one-two, Blair. <laughs> yeah, I did like that subversion of that cliche which it's what you expect it was gonna yeah happen. it gets so tiring all the time I, like i think of like starship troopers which i also love but it's all those things of like oh it's you're gonna have to fight with somebody and then you become friends with them and this it's like gonna no i'm not even bitch. gonna fight you it's just hey i'm i'm joking let's be buds especially they're gonna be squadron mates together why start off on that wrong foot immediately yeah but that's okay because blair did that on his own anyway because yeah. he almost gets into a fight with one of the other pilots because of that cross that he wears. So just as the scuffle begins, the controversial pilgrim cross is shown. And at this point, the other pilot begins to comment until that's when Devereaux shows up and she's like, you know, what's going on here? And she's they get into kind of like a, a prince gets pissed. He runs out. Devereaux's like, the hell are you doing? You can't just walk away from me. And they get into the whole, like, it's kind of BS on why you guys are pretending that. Um, the whole thing was, he got into the ship. He was playing around. Devereaux came up. And then he's like, oh, my God, I didn't realize this belonged to Commander Chen. I didn't know this was his ship. And she's like, he doesn't exist. And he's like, uh, okay. The whole rest of the squadron is doing the same thing. I don't know who you're talking about. That guy doesn't exist. And then finally she breaks it to him at this point when, after the mess hall brawl that... Let me give you a reality check. In all likelihood, you're going to die out here. We're all going to die out here, but none of us need to be reminded of that fact. So you die, you never existed. Understand? Yes, ma'am. I thought it was kind of stupid. It was stupid. So, like... It's a weird... I know they say, oh, we do policy. it because, like, we can't deal with the feelings of losing our friends. Okay, so if that ship is there and that was Chen's ship and you're not letting it get reassigned, do they just have all these derelict ships they're just keeping on their carrier? Or it's like, oh yeah, every so often we just dump them into space. Fire the nuclear arsenal. Yeah, it's like, I can't, sir. <laughs> we're in a war but bad memories. Johnson died and he used to fire the nuclear missiles. Well, can't break policy. Well, as we learn with Lieutenant uh, Forbes later on in the movie, I think they really do just dump it over the side. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> Which yeah, I have thoughts on that, too. We'll get that to it. It was brutal. <laughs> yeah. If I you have a machine eyes. that can go outside an airlock to push the trash off the ship, 
Why don't you have it break? It? <laughs> Why don't you have it push it towards the airlock? I mean, they're literally get that shit off of my. Don't go way. out there. It's past the airlock. You'll die. Send the robot to push it off the ship. <laughs> Pu- push it towards the airlock. Move that non-existent piece of garbage out of the way. Meanwhile, she's like halfway out of the ship, waving, and they're like, "No, <laughs> I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> you will be." I want to go in the ship. So back on the bridge, that's when Taggart arrives. Uh, commanding officers warn of their mistrust. More pilgrim nonsense. They ask how they could trust them, and that's when Taggart <laughs> tosses a ring to them. And then we see through exposition that it's actually Admiral Talwin, Talwin's ring. I don't know why this was given to Taggart. It is never said as to specifically why, but it's just if he has this ring, it means that Talwin really trusts him. So this changes the captain's mind completely. what if later in the movie talwin like goes to his quarters to like get his lucky ring and then he's like where the hell is it <laughs> son of a bitch stole it <laughs> i'm actually working for the kilrathi that damn pilgrim <laughs> cuts the palate and his eye just turns cat-eyed <laughs> he's just looking, why did i help you get to this point i don't know looking a bowl full of milk the signs were all there. How did we know? It's like usual suspects. It's like think back all these moments. Like, <laughs> Wait a minute. How did I miss that? That's why he has the box in his quarters. <laughs> so we cut to Blair in his bunk. Uh, and that's when Maniac enters asking about the cross that Prince wears. It, and this is a right full question. It's like, why the... F- Remember back at the academy? You promised me you would take that thing off. It, it brings me luck. It's gonna get you killed. I was wearing it when I made the jump. Yeah, but that had nothing to do with luck. That was about training, skill, desire. Now please, take the cross off. And he just <laughs> explains that... Uh, He's into it. Yeah, pretty much. So then we hop over to the Concordia battle group. And that's when Talwin's being told about the current situation. No, it's just he. I don't. I. I. I really don't get it. So like, I have conflict with the whole thing too. We. We don't know anything about the pilgrims yet, but it seems like whenever his whatever history they had were destroyed and looking down, and look down upon in history. So like, oh, you're a pilgrim. We don't. We don't like your kind around here. It just caused a lot of issue, and the prejudice against them is high. And though he gains clout with like a few commanders for wearing it, like, oh, you're a pilgrim, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're awesome <laughs> with me. I'm going to, you know, for every like 10 steps he gains for being a pilgrim, he gets set back 10 steps just as much. Oh, you're a pilgrim. Say no more. Say no more. I, I, I guess one weird thing is like, like, did Freddie, did he say like, oh, like, I had to deal with being the, son of a pilgrim my whole life or is this like news to him now like wait wait they don't like the pilgrims like did he well, not know history he, or he seemed to the... know that his mother was a pilgrim oh, that's right, in he, the beginning yeah because he like, hid the cross that's right yeah i think he just knew that there was something about it he just didn't know all the specifics his, his ignorance at this point in time is it, is it, it makes no sense because that's the same as like in firefly all of the brown coats not understanding why no one likes them <laughs> when they're deep in alliance territory. I mean, it's just you are literally the enemy and you're carrying a Confederate flag, a Nazi symbol kind of thing of just the war was that bad. You're harboring a symbol of the enemy. Yeah, I can see why the prejudice is there. I wish and they really went more into it as to why they were possibly good people. And yeah, the source or like, their origin was genuine and it was great that they did what they did. But at the same time, like, yo man, if you got, if your people thought that you guys were godlike and you there, a war happened because of it, it's kind of fucked up that you're still carrying that symbol. Yeah. So we hop over to the Concordia battle group and Talwin's being told the situation currently right now. That's when he pushes the ships faster despite gaining casualties. So they're running at like 200% power and the guy's like, hey, the bridge is like, or the engine room's on fire, and we lost like six guys. And Talwin's just like, hmm, raise it 20%. <laughs> we sure and did. And we just got back over to Maniac and Rosie, <laughs> returning from a patrol. It's the first time we actually see some kind of action in the the Starfighters. 
and this is the 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 first like mm, I didn't like this. So Maniac lands back on the ship, showboating as he lands his fighter in the hangar by going inverted, thinking he's funny. And then Rosie not only repeats the maneuver, but she also adds a couple of extra rolls in just as she lands. And this is where his call sign is actually officially given to him. But I really don't like it when pilots in movies do this kind of thing, because like I know it's a movie, but the risk involved in doing a stunt like that, you would lose your license so fast. You'd be lucky to be flying rubber dog shit out of Hong Kong at that point. <laughs> well, he was keeping up relations, you know, flipping the bird. Oh, because he was he was inverted. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just it drives me crazy seeing shit like that, and it's kind of a an omen for later on anyway. But it's not even a case of like, oh, he could have died. It's like, no, there were people that were jumping out of the way that if they weren't paying attention, he would have just killed a bunch of crew. If he stopped like <laughs> one foot short or like too long, he would have killed a guy. Yeah, the guy was like pressed up against like a like a rack or something, and the nose of the ship was pretty much pressing into his chest. But yeah, it's it's messed up, and it's just like the risk involved. It's it's so, you know, the ships are expensive to do something like that. It's just it's unheard of. There's a lot of ways that you can showboat, and that's just pure carelessness and reckless. It's too reckless. Yeah, you don't want to do that. It shows that they're wild and reckless, but almost to like I mean, not almost to a fault. It almost would have been better if they had them doing like I don't know the aliens knife game. In the uh, cafe, the cafe, in the, you know, the mess hall. <laughs> yeah. In the bistro, if you will. I, I find it hard. How did they, how do they land normally? Do they show that in the movie at some point? It like, doesn't look like they have wheels in it. I think it's a magnet because every time they took off, it looked like just landing struts were scraping on the bottom of the ship. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I thought it was just, they get as low as they can. They jump out. The ship goes off into space and then they pick up one of the ones from the dead guy. Sorry. The non-existent guy. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Star Lord, man. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to believe that they don't have some kind of like anti-gravity or like <laughs> a Harrier a jet, yeah. a Harrier jet can take yeah. off vertically. VTOL. Like you can't come in yeah. nicely to the... I mean, that's, that's <laughs> the part. Just barreling towards... <laughs> Every pilot just runway. comes in screaming. That's that's the part of like space stuff that uh, you got to go with it when it comes to certain physics. And I feel they didn't think that through because it makes a lot more sense to me to do the, you know, the vertical takeoff than it would be to just let's just just like a normal plane just we're gonna go down a runway and then there's gonna be actual gravity where you see the ship fall off and you know like the full weight oh, of the wait, ship yeah it it's, does I mean, unless the like, ship has a gravity field which i assume they'd have to for them to stay on it i don't know all the I mean, crew comes out get... and forms a daisy chain and they're just like ready yeah. <laughs> they just I, catch it i understand you enter into the ship and okay the ship has gravity but make the bay a little higher than at that point enter at the top and then throw on your thrusters reverse thrusters and then just land nicely during the clone wars the venators had um a design very similar to this ship but instead of a runway where you keep going straight the the bay doors opened so you have the runway but everything would be just taking off vertically instead because that makes so much more sense like why do you need to gain speed can't you just taxi out after a certain point and then just full thruster right after that point? Why do you have to kind of like, I don't know. True. Yeah. Why do they need to ramp That's a great up? Point. Like in space, do there's that no acceleration space. or there's no force to stop acceleration. So it's just. Right. It's more, it's should be more. I mean, at, um, at that rate, all they need is like too. a bunch of crew to just push you towards the edge and you're good. Yeah. I don't get it. You're just going to fall out of the spaceship. I'm going to digress just a bit don't because it always, it always bothered me a lot. But just I, I, I thought it made sense in The Last Jedi. But a lot of people complain on how there's no gravity in space. So how do those bombers work? But I figure like in real space physics, there's nothing to stop it once it's in motion kind of thing. So just right. the bombs are pushed down physically. Like they're actually pushed, not yeah, dropped. Yeah, they're ejected. Yeah. Right. 
and people were complaining. I'm like, that's not how gravity works. I'm like, that's exactly how gravity works. It's it's being shot out. That's how yeah. that's how a vacuum works. That's how yeah. no gravity works. Yeah, and the, the pure velocity of the exiting thing is just like it's going, and then it releases at that perfect time for it to can keep that momentum up. And I feel the ships could have done something similar. They don't have to. They don't have to rock it out just to gain momentum to go up. They can just kind of go slow, and then that's it. I don't get it. It's actually a defense for the last what? Jedi. <laughs> I know. I was like, yeah, well, it's got to be true. Nick is is making sense of it. <laughs> Yeah, that, that whole that whole scene still is just stupid. Well, but yeah. So anyway, they do that weird landing, and then like Maniac gets in trouble, and then Forbes goes in and like offers a drink to Devra, which I guess like that's fine if it's your commanding officer to just hang out. But I like how the two girls, female characters in the movie together. immediately start talking about how amazing Maniac is, and immediately fails the Bechdel test for Wing Commander. <laughs> that's right. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> he's a reckless asshole but he is cute yeah it just it really doesn't help the movie much <clears throat> uh tiger claws captain gets called to the bridge while looking at the ring and reminiscing of the past i thought that scene was real weird <laughs> no context throughout anything else you see a picture of two younger men who look nothing like any of the actors in the movie he's holding the ring and that's it <laughs> Sansky, you never did take that photo after you bought that frame. I know, I just like it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to the kill Rappy. This is where uh, they play Dream Phone in Devro's bunk. <laughs> and then uh, Blair visits Tagger and asks about his pilgrim heritage. After living with this uh, heritage for the last 25 years, he's finally told why no one likes him. <laughs> <laughs> was homeschooled so why am i getting my ass kicked all the time <laughs> <laughs> drives me crazy man it just makes no sense it makes no sense it's time we have the talk <laughs> you so, went to school in texas they weren't allowed to teach uh, they weren't allowed to teach a pilgrimage, pilgrimage. <laughs> so i didn't notate when this happens in the movie but this is the this is the the missing piece of exposition that was needed through the entire course of the movie leading up to this moment. Cause the whole time it's like, why do you wear this cross that literally is a sign for you to get your ass kicked by anyone that sees it? And you get all this shit and disbelief given to you because you wear this cross and you don't understand why this is the reason for it. So out of all of that, yeah, they were the first people to explore the galaxy, but they got a superiority complex because of it. And it started a war. That's it. But who were they fighting at that point? Everyone they else. Were just all the same people. I'm still. better than you. I, I I explored space. I'm better than you, Dean. Big Do brain something. Versus so are they small saying? Brain. Are they saying like maybe the people literally on Earth, like everybody back on Earth? Is that what they meant? Right? Okay. Yeah. All space the men versus the ground, the crawlers, earthworms. Oh, Terrarian call them earthworms. Oh, earthworms would have been better. Yeah. Earthworms. Spineless, brainless slugs. So he explains all this to uh, Blair. And then um, as if Taggart had any pull to make this, this request, he tells Blair that they'll be jumping to hyperspace soon and he wants him present for it. Okay. To our knowledge, this merchant ship captain wants a military fighter pilot to be present on the bridge when they jump into hyperspace. Okay. <laughs> hey, he had that ring. I, I guess so. So Call the ship Super prepares. Ring. <laughs> it looked like it's just a class ring too. <laughs> what if it was his class ring? <laughs> yeah, right. So here's our matrix moment. So as they approach the point of no return to the pulsar, Taggart insists to continue despite the computer's warnings. The computer is like freaking out. They're getting too close to the gravity well and all that. And they push forward, ready to make the jump. And then we finally see a pre-Matrix bullet time 90 degree spin sequence as the ship makes the I thought jump. It was, cool. Everyone it was a good moment of tension. Alert. They made it. Well, I like how also all of the sound Dramatic. drops for it. It was. That it really just did kind of seem unique well 
for three weeks at least. Mm. It really puts it in a perspective, not realizing the Matrix hadn't come out yet. Yeah. So it's like, oh, they weren't a copycat of, oh, the Matrix was popular. It's like, no, they had no idea how the Matrix would do. So the Matrix came out March 31st. So it was like just a couple weeks. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, what a inopportune time, like I said, because it's like later that month, the Matrix, and then two weeks later, Phantom Menace. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, we made $17 million. Well, Matrix made $471 million, and then Phantom Menace made $1 billion. Yeah. Because at they least... printed money for it. With the Matrix effect, a lot of movies parodied it. A lot of I mean, even did. Scary Movie did. And Shrek. Oh, yeah. But it's crazy to know that this actually came out first. Yeah. And it just blow that honestly blows my mind. I, I want to start like a an unwritten campaign of people just referring it as the Wing Commander effect. <laughs> the next time <laughs> oh the, the Matrix effect? Oh, you mean the Wing Commander effect? <laughs> and then they're gonna be like, what? No, and then it's like, no, go back and watch Wing Commander. And they're like, no, I won't. And I'm like, okay, yeah. well, watch this clip. <laughs> Uh, Captain calls for a scouting party to check out the nearby asteroid fields. So Blair and Angel, who's just Devereaux's call sign, are sent out to investigate. Uh, they see the remains of the Pegasus. So Blair wasn't full of shit when he said that it was getting destroyed. And that's just uh, the Pegasus is just one of the Terran uh, capital ships or the Earth capital ships. Uh, the sensors pick up a nearby Kilrathi ships and they hide. So a little Easter egg. So... Prince talks to his ship's computer called Merlin, and this is apparently an uncredited cameo from Mark Hamill because he's also in the actual Wing Commander video game, who's a.k.a. Luke Skywalker. But um, he is a voice actor, yep. and you can kind of you can kind of hear it in the computer voice. They did a really good job of masking it. Like when I hear skips from regular show, I just hear Mark <laughs> Hamill. Same I just want to like say, Joker. I, I love that they were able to get skips to voice the AI in this. Yeah. And in this, it was a lot harder to kind of pick up on it, but it's definitely there. It's just certain things he say, you can, oh, like that's definitely Mark Hamill. But I digress. Uh, Blair sees that the Kilrathi has detected Angel's heat signature and warns her. Uh, they spring from their hiding places and retreat. Back on the capital ship, his judgment is brought into question due to his pilgrim heritage. Again, Taggart well, offers his she turns on him so fast yeah because uh gerald is not like, even not even blinking it twice it could be a pilgrim spy thing and she's like yeah, yeah. it could be and it's yeah. like <laughs> wow what a commanding officer i was like smeagol dropping my bread life, comes, breadcrumbs on sam <laughs> 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 yeah that was pretty brutal especially in how he's trying to like, that's Blair's love interest, and she's ready to backstab him faster than Smeagol trying to get the ring. <laughs> I had no analogy there. I mean, it's kind of like the it. Pilgrim Cross, I suppose. They both yeah. wear it around their neck. My precious. Everybody wants to beat him for it. <laughs> Taggart offers his advice here to avoid conflict oh, and ignore the Kilrathi communication vessel they just found. But of course, command just ignores it because it's some pilgrim ruse. Which Sansky up until this point was pretty good about like listening to everybody and taking into consideration. And then this was the first point where it's like, no, take a crew and destroy the ship. And he's like, that's a bad idea. Do it anyway. Mm. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. So after the pilots were dismissed, Blair barges into Angel's quarters and explains his history with the Pilgrims, which, I mean, that grounds for court martial alone. But, um, <laughs> which also I like how it's like you want to hear something I just learned too right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hot off the presses, I just learned this. I actually don't know all the details. I'll be right back. Where's I mean, Taggart? she could probably fill him in. She's like, no, yeah, I went to Earth School. We know about this. Yeah, I just so, had this listed as, oh, exposition time. Yeah, she was just as unsure about Blair's allegiance until he explains that the cross he wears is just for luck. His mother's a pilgrim, 
His father was a Confederate, and both of them were dead before he reached the age of five. <laughs> well, as long as they're dead. I really hate to admit this, and I was a little too far ahead in to uh, rewind because I was really mentally drained from watching this. All I have to say is Angel explains her past to him. I guess she grew up in an orphanage, and I don't remember exactly why she is called Angel. Is Was she because she was praying to angels? I think she was everybody else was praying to angels. I also zoned I, out at this point because I was I'm, busy writing exposition time. Yeah, I was. I am very <laughs> sorry for skipping this point of her little exposition that she's given, but it just was really thin. Maniac and Forbes refuel. Yeah, he uh, Maniac is enjoying himself with Rosie, and so they are both called down to the flight deck for duty. Some of the fighter pilots are against flying with a pilgrim, and Angel calls on Blair to fly with her as a token of, like, I guess, an apology. For the outburst from earlier. <laughs> Sorry for saying you're a treasonist. Yeah. Speaking of treason, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> so her squadron flies off into the asteroid field, and this is the most Wing Commander scene of the entire Wing Commander movie. Searching for any hostiles, uh, Maniac spots a signature, and before the squadron can engage, Taggart orders the squadron to stand down. Angel tries to disavow the requests, but he insists while declaring his true na naval rank with a confirmation code. So the diligent captain is actually a Commodore, codenamed Paladin, and he insists that the attack is just a diversion and the squadron attacking the squadron is just attacking decoys while the Tiger Claw gets attacked by the main battle group. And that's, that's kind of exactly what happens. He is so cool. I don't understand why he hit that for so long. He wanted to earn their respect his own way. Yeah, what? By saying he's a pilgrim and a nobody merchant ship. It's just like the fisherman. Like, it's the it's fuck, the guy from Jaws trying to go on to, like, <laughs> Area 51 to tell everybody, hey, there's an alien ship. I know how to kill this thing about to attack us. It's like, it's no, like we're, we're good. A government and meeting. He's like, he scratches his nails on the chalkboard and then three guys open fire. Then he pulls out an ID card and you realize that he's like second to the president in terms of rank. And you're like, oh, we'll listen to you now. I have to point something out. When they take off, so they come out of the, I guess it's just a matter, oh, sorry, I don't pick it apart like the science. I guess it's a matter of where gravity starts at this ship because they come out of the force field airlock and they're still just building up airspeed, quote unquote, scraping along the ship. And then yep. when they reach the end of the runway, they drop off, like, grab, like yep. they fall down, and then they take off. Isn't it great? <laughs> that's, that's all. Well, it's because they don't have forward thrusters, so they have to launch them, and then they just continue falling until they go completely through the universe and come back from the top and have to land back <laughs> on the ship. Like, there's a theory with Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, that when he throws it, it's not just him throwing it. It's actually... Mjolnir manipulating the universe to move around it. And that's exactly what's happening, but with all 13 <laughs> of the fighter ships that are exiting out of that. They're not moving anywhere. They're moving the ship away. And just because there's nothing beneath them, it looks like they drop a little bit. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. That's all. So it, it, he's, a, he's a Commodore. Okay, that was not expected. Don't know why that was uh, even a thing. We cut back to the Tiger Claw. We see that Paladin's suspicions are true. They're getting attacked, and the whole thing that the fighter squadron was going after was just a decoy. Uh, the flight crew scrambles to get their fighters airborne or whatever that's left, so they launch six starfighters in defense against, as they say, three dozen Kilrathi starfighters, two destroyers, and one battle cruiser. So... Needless to say, they're they're kind of up shit's creek without a paddle. So with a force this large, the six fighter squadron doesn't really have a chance. You hear radio chatter as the fighters take on the Kilrathi fighters, but the destroyers have begun bombarding the Tiger Claw with missiles. The Tiger Claw fires back, taking out one of the destroyers, which was pretty cool. And then Tiger Claw continues to take fire from the torpedoes, but this makes them lose the ability to fire torpedoes themselves. They're just taking too much damage. 
I thought this was a cool sequence. And the cockpit views really gave me video game vibes. Yeah, and I appreciated they went that route as well. I feel that if they were to try to do a bit more CGI, it would have really lost its flair. Yeah. And it wouldn't have carried the movie as much as it did. But seeing them in real cockpits and you got to see the actors' faces, like X-Wing style, like in the Star Wars movies anyway, and like Top Gun, same thing. It, it really worked in this sort of situation. Yeah. Because I feel nowadays it's just though they'd rather just green screen 95% of the entire ship. And there's no practical effect of them sitting in a cockpit. It's just like even the helmet is CGI at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so seeing them in like He's full back. costume. Yeah. They call Johnny Golf Balls. <laughs> Johnny Golf Balls. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some dodgy effects here. I think the, oh, the bigger, the, the bigger, whole movie's a like, dodgy effect. The, <laughs> <laughs> the bigger sweeping stuff looks decent, but when you get those like shots of the, some of the from the cockpit, like shooting and like the things blowing up, it just kind of looks funky. But well, I mean, the explosions yeah. look like Star Wars, ex- like classic Star Wars explosions. Of yeah, you can tell it's just like eight different explosion images or clips just played over the top of whatever it is. Yeah, they did. I thought it was a good job yeah. for what it was, and c- contextual of when the movie came out in relation to everything else. I thought this one did a pretty decent enough job in terms of special effects because you always like from the I'll I'll say from like the 80s because that's when the 80s really started to do special effects um, with computers and stuff. But at least like from the 80s all the way up to. um, Let's just say Avatar leading up to that point in time, you really see when the big advancements and special effects come into play. And because this is before star wars episode one and after jurassic park it kind of fits in perfectly with that point in time because i know it's miles ahead of like the scorpion king yeah i don't think anything in this was like jarring no no it's it i mean no, yeah no special effect in this is enough to be like like if everything else in this movie was perfect i'd be like whatever the special effects it's, it doesn't it doesn't take away from the movie i would say the special effects are not the biggest problem for, of You've the read movie. the script. <laughs> Next comes the best decision two pilots can make after pulling off a Marriage. very difficult. Oh. St- <laughs> <laughs> this fall on ABC, Maniac and the call other one. I forget oh. her. Yeah, the <laughs> Rosie Forbes. No call. Rosie sign. Forbes. Taggart moves in. He has a bomber frigate for whatever reason, and then um, losing his escort as they draw near. The Tiger Claws getting hammered. The captain getting injured and being brought to the med bay. Paladin sneaks his way to the Kelrathi ship, unleashing a huge payload of warheads to destroy it completely. This was cool. That was I, cool. I thought that the whole thing was pretty like uh, the... awesome. Yeah, it's like a don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes kind of deal. Yeah. All right, so here's the bullshit. So <laughs> Maniac asks if Rosie wants to hunt some Kilrathi and engage a fleeing squadron. Rosie eliminates one charging fighter, and then Maniac tries to one-up her. But um, because they're both stupid, she ends up getting uh, her ship crashes into the charging ship puts yeah. his ship in a critical condition that was stupid he's being reckless of he's going straight on towards him not firing and it's oh i'm going to fire at the last second and then pull out of the way great she's right behind you so firing on a guy who's that close coming forward and then shifting out of the way is now going to launch wreckage into rosie they were both dumb he was dumbest they were both dumb that's actually what they put on the tombstone. They were both. If they had one, because they don't exist. Oh, they don't have to have a tombstone for for Rosie right now. Here's where my friend's tombstone would be if I had one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they probably say like, oh, it's so we can deal with our feelings. I feel like that's probably just like a space governmental budget tactic of they never existed, which means we don't have to pay their families or for their funerals or for anything. 
<laughs> I don't know who I don't know who flew this ship. There's no record of it, but we just lost 18 million. Don't know how. <laughs> just randomly vanished. So yeah, this is the the whole dumb thing. So she's alive for now. Her ship is extremely damaged and she limps it back to the carrier. Just as she's trying to land the thing, she loses control and crash lands onto the runway. The runway extends from the hangar itself um, and straight through, but right outside the hangar is like an airlock force field. And then you're just out in space for like a good, like another 200 feet. And that's where the rest of the runway is. So she crash lands in the space part of the hangar. <clears throat> um, Maniac lands and rushes over to the wreckage, but he can't go over to it. So like that's when Blair kind of tackles him down while Maniac's in hysterics. He wants to rescue her, but the flight deck must be cleared. Everyone thinks, and at least they say they know she didn't make it. But Maniac must now watch in horror as her destroyed fighter is pushed off the side of the landing strip. By a device that can clearly choose a direction and chooses to push her off. Yep. He's saying, yeah, like, no, wait. I could still see um, her eyes. She's alive. Oh. She's alive. And it's, Which also, no. how good is his eyesight that, like, he can see across through the airlock to her ship? I guess, what was it? It was like, oh, they're regrouping. They're going to be coming back. So we have to get the hell out of here. That's... That was the whole reason? Or we just need to keep going on their mission? No, they, they were all returning back because they were low on... They were, like, running on fumes. Right. Yeah. Which, they're in space, so just idle without power? Um, I mean, also, they, this whole thing could have been avoided if you didn't have to fucking land your spacecraft, like... <laughs> like a chump? <laughs> Or a by literally very, just crashing very into the bay. Easy choice. You want to go hunt <laughs> Kilrathi? No. Yeah, that I was mean, the first part. But. Running out of fuel is a perfectly good example of how to set up an entire space movie. So, I mean, <laughs> take it as you will, but running out of fuel <laughs> is a legitimate concern in a war that happens to be set in the stars. The, I, yeah. Yeah. They should have. Put the reverse thrusters on. Just sit there. Turn off your power. Wait yeah. for the wreckage to be... Just drop anchor. And, you yeah. know... <laughs> we'll be in in a minute. <laughs> I'll admit, it does make me want to play the game to see if you have to land it. I can imagine the landing is like Top Gun from Nintendo. <laughs> but clearly, I Rosie never this played level. it. I keep crashing in the land. <laughs> it's funny, because most people die the same way Rosie just did. So, getting slowly pushed off the <laughs> the runway by a a guy in a car. Yep, off the runway, but falling I'm still down alive. the I'm gravity. I'm so of sorry. Space. I was. These are orders. I was told. And the thing I don't get to is this is the space portion. So I mean, unless there's persistent gravity at this point in time, if they just pushed it off the side, it was just kind of float there. That's what. I, that's the whole thing with them taking off and like sinking as they leave the runway. Maybe that's part Same of the idea. plot because else it, her her ship would have just kind of stayed there. <laughs> Why couldn't they just turn off gravity bit. for a second and pitch the ship down? I mean, I don't. <laughs> we can go all night with that. <laughs> just Devra throw a lands, throw a rope. Right, they could have done in. anything. It's, it's, it's space. You can just pull. Or you know, so Dev- still have the snowplow pull it in. Devro lands. She's pissed. <laughs> She cites that disobeying a direct order is considered treason treason, and during wartime it's punishable by death. I think that's another movie trope because whenever treason happens, it's always during wartime and it's always punishable by death. But anyway, she uh, gets a pistol, points it at Maniac's face and threatens him just never to repeat that else it's going to be his head. And honestly, I think he did kind of get off easy here. Man, what kind of balls would this movie have had? He just, she straight up shot him, like, just right, boom. Just close up of Freddie Prince Jr. and just the spatter on his face. <laughs> That's why they call her Angel. She's the Angel of Death. <laughs> <laughs> so, meanwhile, Captain Gerald lands the Tiger Claw in an asteroid crater and deploys a, de- a decoy buoy to distract the remaining Kilrathi. Uh, and this actually does work. All the Kilrathi warships start chasing the decoy, minus one ship 
and they uh they're like oh crap so this is one of the movie moments where i didn't un- really understand so the ship goes into like a submarine style stealth mode and then all their crew members like go silent um what i don't un- what i don't get is that this is in space and because they're in a vacuum no matter how loud you get <laughs> no one will hear you <laughs> it's a tagline to a specific movie where in space no one can hear you scream. So well, the, why are they being silent? The in problem a was it's because they kept their comms on. Oh no! I mean they were like <laughs> actively like shh to each other on the they bridge. They were still they broadcasting weren't... to the other enemy ship. Ugh, I mean weird flex, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, should we so, just shut this off? No, no just so, be quiet. So it should have been like just be like. Quiet. Sir, should we stop the rave we're having? No, we're in space. Just do what you want. <laughs> Party like it's the end of Matrix 3. <laughs> you know the scene. You mean the beginning of Matrix oh, 2. Sorry, yeah. Come on. Uh, the Zion rave. <laughs> you guys see Blade? They had an awesome rave at the beginning. <laughs> Check it out. At the beginning. <laughs> it uh, Not so much at the end of that rave. <laughs> Some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate uphill. <laughs> so the Kelrathi destroyer or the Kelrathi ship begins bombing craters to try to flush out the Tiger Claw. Though they don't really know where the Tiger Claw is, they're just they're still trying. Uh, the damages from like the impact blasts are nearby enough to start depressurizing like the flight crew d- uh, deck. Blair almost gets sucked out of a small hole in the side of the or in like the. They closed the main hangar doors, and I guess there was a small enough hole that was enough to almost suck Freddie Prince Jr. through. Like an alien um, resurrection situation? Yeah. Um, Maniac uses a wire cable tied around his waist and uh, kind of leaps after him, and the it really messes him up, and you see like the injury afterward. The entire cool. time, I'm like, if this is strong enough to suck people out of the airlock, how is this metal wire cable not cutting him in half? And then after they like save Freddie Prince Jr., he's like laying there, like blood coming out of his mouth. And he's just like all torn up. It's like, oh, it was cutting him in half. Yeah. yeah. For this scene. <laughs> I appreciated that. And I yeah, love how later too, she's like, I need my best pilot out there. And like, ma'am, he is almost in half. <laughs> his legs get up and walk out of the room. <laughs> Both have some my best pilot. And then comes back and he puts his body on. They start loading Forbes' dead body into the ship. No, my best alive pilot. <laughs> she just floats by the window. I'm still here. <laughs> but they can't hear because it's space. So Maniac does save him, letting the crew gain enough time to properly seal it, which they just threw a thing over it. I don't I don't know. And there's a, the, the, it's the front door to the hangar where all the ships leave. Why why is that a problem? When the ships leave, there's a force field. Couldn't they just turn the force field on or just left the hangar open? I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, unless the force fields were down from the explosion that was coming back up. or The the, the thing was closed already. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. These ship designs I mean, are the, stupid. The weirder thing to me is we have, in succession, Forbes dies, this scene happens, and then it's Blair having a scene with Devereaux being like, you need to go talk to Maniac. He's really upset about Forbes's death and he's oh. double checking all his decisions. <laughs> and it's like, all his decisions. We've seen one scene since she died and he immediately sprung into action to go save you. So it seems out of place. No one died. Wasn't there? Oh, no. Oh, no one died. Yeah. So that's what triggers the next scene is that Freddie Prince Jr. thinks that whole no one died thing is bullshit. And it, it, it really was. I He had every right to call her out on it. Like, What is it, Lieutenant? Can we stop this, please? I'm sorry about Forbes. I don't know who you're talking about. Don't. Look, it's a shitty game, Angel. Rosie deserves more. What do you suggest I do about it? Look, he feels responsible. And so he should. His confidence is shot. And he's questioning every move he made. He can't go back up there like this. And right now, I think we need all the pilots we can get. I'll think about it. Maniac knows he's, he fucked up. It's, it's, 
you can see it in his eyes. You know, like he's that's gonna haunt him for the rest of his life. You could have shot him right there, and that would have been not a punishment, but more of a um, like a reward. Kills. Yeah, <laughs> reward. <laughs> it's a weird Pavlovian response. It's just it's it it. He's gonna live with that for the rest of his life. He's he's killing him is only kind of making it better for him. Yeah, so back on the bridge, the plot to The Last Jedi rears its ugly head, and the ship's fuel runs low. So Taggart has an idea, and Devro's crew assembles, and this is where she buries the hatchet with Maniac, and he suits up. And this is all in the span of not even five minutes. So this, the flight deck is bustling with while a commando squad loads into a dropship. I don't know why the acting captain of the ship and a fighter pilot is with a ground crew that's going to... <laughs> Like storm an enemy ship. I mean, weird flex, but okay. Don't understand it. <laughs> I did like yeah. the one line between Gerald and Paladin, which was when um he asks Gerald like, "Why are you down here too?" Leading, and he's like, "Oh, like I can't leave it up to like a, a merchant ship and a pilgrim or something like that." And then he said, "He really is a good guy once you get to know him." <laughs> Taggart has an idea of stealing fuel from the passing ship, which they discovered to actually be the communication cruiser, or the, the hell they called it, the CONCOM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they discovered earlier the one that originally started, like, the where they were trying to go after. The commandos board the Kilrathi ship, which is also led by Blair. Again, don't know why he's leading this crew of soldiers, because <laughs> he's a fighter pilot, not an infantry soldier, but whatever. <laughs> I have literally never held a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Is it loaded? And he like aims it at his mouth three times. <laughs> Guess not. Oh man! Like there's some like suspension of disbelief. I get it for some points in this movie. Fully get it, but just I don't. I don't see Tom Cruise losing goose and then him going like. You know, <laughs> giving him a rifle and being like, now join the infantry unit. Yeah, go get him. And it's just, I don't see that being in the same movie. I, I really don't think Maverick knows how to use a, a rifle at all. Compared to like. He would still be shooting into the air after the, uh, the MiGs. Yeah. Pilgrims were said to have come out of the womb holding guns. They knew instinctively <laughs> how to shoot. Their mothers were not very excited about it. That's how actually the pilgrims died, <laughs> perished their children. <laughs> Gun-related safety accidents. Each one accidents. could have one child. That's it. <laughs> Blair makes his way to the Kilrathi bridge, and he discovers that uh, he just discovers the Pegasus AI. So back on the bridge, uh, Gerard wants to, or Gerald wants to send the Kilrathi jump coordinates back to Earth, and then with this, Earth will know exactly where the Kilrathi will arrive, setting up a devastating trap for them. That's the, probably the only good idea in this whole movie. Uh, the drones meant to deliver the data are offline. Surprise, surprise. So Taggart volunteers Blair on this suicide mission. And as, gest <laughs> as a gesture of faith, uh, Taggart gives Blair his own pilgrim necklace, Blair had no idea, but as an audience member and kind of common sense, it's no surprise that Taggart has one of these crosses on I him. I mean, what if Taggart was like, I also just found out I was a pilgrim. <laughs> <laughs> and then the crew just descend on him. Go, Blair! <laughs> I, uh, the, um, sorry, go to, to go back a bit. I think I realized a big problem with this movie is... The script. The Kilrathi are very... They look like Archer, Emissary of the Gorgonites. Well, yeah, the, you can tell there wasn't much money spent on that alien well, creature. Force, evidently, but more so, they're just like not very present in the movie. They're just like, okay, they're in their ships, they're fighting pilots. You kind of see them, but they don't seem like a huge threat. Well, I guess. evidently, also the the look of them was a little changed because I guess they built the sets before they finished, or they finished them before they finished the sets so the sets were too small to fit their suits and animatronics and whatnot so all of them had to be like that weird hunched kind of maneuver so it kind of made them look a little odd but yeah like the they're the weakest part of the the movie but they're used very sparingly it didn't help with the overabundance of fog machines being used 
You could barely see them as it was. And I hated when they had the scenes of them talking and then it would just like translate subtitles for them. Like, we don't need to know what they're saying back and forth between <laughs> each other. They I think just, they took that from Independence It just Day. seems so hokey. Yeah, same effect. They There was no face. There's no leader of they're just like kind of like a group of aliens that they don't have a leader look like cats don't seem very threatening other than we know they're trying to destroy the earth but nobody has a confrontation with kill them. Rafi like, or communist main society character does not <laughs> <laughs> we're all the leaders we the people of the kill Rafi. <laughs> true communist <laughs> space communism is the way <laughs> <laughs> This was a very capitalist film. Um, I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space. space. <laughs> Not only space, but <laughs> yeah, that I just want, I just wanted to point that out. Like when you see them finally in here, it's like they're not really present. So it's the threat doesn't really seem that and there's, bad, I guess. And realistically. They don't really kill a lot of our heroes in this movie. The only one of our crew to die is Rosie. And that's mainly because of <laughs> Maniac. Just... So <laughs> the Kilrathi, not really that impressive in battle. They just kind of get shellacked yeah. to the point where they think that it's definitely... a game going after them. It definitely hurts the, mo- the movie, like the drama of the movie. Yeah, like you can really tension. tell that the Confederacy or whatever they're called is like punching down. That's one way to put it. Also, I like how Paladin reveals he's a pilgrim, and Blair is like, why didn't you tell me? You didn't ask. Touche. <laughs> I, I, That's a bad response. <laughs> well, also, he couldn't ask because he didn't know what a what pilgrim a was up until about 36 minutes ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm amazed he knew where he was at that point in time in the movie itself. <laughs> Blair, I have something to tell you. Lost... I'm also a pilgrim. A what? <laughs> oh, He's just God. so lost through the whole movie. And it just... I, I love Freddie Prince Jr. as an actor. But man, his... He he really didn't swing hard with this Well, role. they didn't... I, they did not give yeah, a lot of meat in that script to chew yeah. on. No. It's true. Because I don't blame him whatsoever in any of this. And it's just... It's so brutal. Like, I couldn't it's do any better. I really couldn't. And it's just, man, the plot points were bad. So now that he has this mission, the final mission, Angel and Blair race to their jump point. Angel finds a cloaking missile on its way to the Tiger Claw. She diverts to intercept. She explodes the missile. Her ship gets destroyed, but she ejects in time. Her escape pod doesn't have enough oxygen to survive until rescue. And they have a little moment together, but Devereaux just tells Blair that he must complete the mission. Well, also at this point, like, they both put, like, their hands to the glass and she said something like, go, Chris. I forgot his name was Chris, but... Me too. I almost looked it up to see if it really was Chris. And then Blair looks at her and he's like, who? Who? (laughs) You. My name's John. (laughs) Chris, the pilgrim, the what? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) What are we doing right now? (laughs) So Blair pushes his ship to the warp point, all the while the Kilrathi fleet uh, sees him and they press forward. Um, Capital ships exchange fire and laser, a missile and laser fire. I thought this was cool on how they had like a a broadside against the Kilrathi cruiser and the Tiger Claw. Um, back with Blair after having to feed new coordinates into the computer about a hundred times until he finally makes the jump to light speed. He makes a distress call and he thinks it's too late because nobody's responding back to him, which I thought was kind of rude. I think earth even knows that he's a pilgrim and was giving him a hard time because <laughs> they clearly heard him and were doing like mobilizing afterwards. Well, it's because he called collect probably. Blair, the pilgrim, not is, is trying to access a call. Would you care to accept the charges? No. Who? The pilgrim? Click. First name, Chris. Second name, the Karathi are on their way. Please get out now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dig the whole thing with 
paladin leading the ship there the the whole his portion of the movie feels like a rogue trader tabletop campaign that i would love Mm. to play of just space shenanigans and all of the the back and forth where it's it's nothing flashy it's nothing fancy it's just like no it's just smart handling of how to both operate their ships Mm. Do we just assume that um, Jacques Lafleur, the captain, is just chilling in the medic bay? The sick. I bay? thought, yeah, I thought he died because I feel like every time in this movie they when carry they, him off and he's alive. Yeah, every movie or every part of this movie where they scream for a medic, it's like they're dead, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> well, then again, if they're dead, they just push him off the side, <laughs> so we didn't see him go anywhere. So it's safe to assume he still made it. They're trying to. Like, I don't have time they're for. They're trying this. to push him off the side. He's pushing back. It turns into like a little sumo back and forth of just slap, slap, that's, slap, slap, slap. That's gonna be the uh, way that you know that I'm finally dead. It's just <laughs> push my casket off the side <laughs> to the hole. <laughs> don't lower me and just push it. It's still halfway sticking out of the ground when they. Come up. <laughs> I didn't know how gravity works. I'm sorry. <laughs> So we have a bit of poetry in the end of this movie on how it rhymes with the first part and how uh, the Keltrathi ship did follow, what's his name, Blair, through the jump point, and it followed him. So one fighter against a Star Destroyer is not going to do anything. Was it the Snake Ear? Sure. And he sees the... (laughs) a nearby gravity well and it's the same one that was they almost collided into at the beginning of the movie so he decides you know what let me do the same thing let me lure the big ship too close to that uh, gravity well he does it the big ship which i think should have definitely known better and it's just really stupid on how they fell for such a really basic space tactic in my eyes but whatever he gets really close. The big ship gets follows through. It gets stuck in the gravity well. It can't get out. It gets sucked into the gravity well, and it gets destroyed. Uh, Blair was able to escape just in time. Meanwhile, Talwin's fleet was able to make it to the jump point, and just as we see the Kilrathi fleet start to exit hyperspace, they're only doing it one by one, single file, and that's just enough time for every single ship to get destroyed within seconds of arriving. So their whole plan did work. Earth is saved. By checkoff singularity. Um, Yep. Blair makes it back to the Tiger Claw by defying all physics of space and time. So this is the thing that really bothered me a lot because he lands on the Talwin ship and he speaks with Talwin face to face. And then over the radio, they're getting a live communication that Taggart went off to find Angel, picked her up, and was bringing her into the hangar right then at that moment. And then seconds later, Freddie Prince Jr. is told, like, you're on the wrong ships, uh, you know, Lieutenant. <laughs> he runs off the bridge. And then as if going downstairs, he magically finds himself back on the Tiger Claw. To basically, you know, kiss and hold Devro, realizing that she's still alive. You're on the wrong ship, Lieutenant. No pilgrims allowed on this. You drag them out. Cut to the, cut these out of the air. <laughs> <laughs> they toss them outside. Forbes rolls by. <laughs> Welcome. And that, and that is Wing Commander. It's a bit of a limp ending, just yeah. the way it just goes <laughs> Well, on. I like how, in my notes, I have, like, Talwin greets Blair, Paladin found Devro, Blair wills her back to life so they can kiss before the end. Oh, yeah, she's still injured. And then I have the next section that starts the end, because I thought there was going to be, like, a wrap-up. And then it's just the end. Oh, it's the credits. I thought there'd be more. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's it. <laughs> I really thought there was more Wing Commander in the Wing Commander movie. It really had only t- not even two scenes. I I I don't get how like all right, you know, there's no special effects in Top Gun, but I would imagine it's still really expensive to hire military planes and have them fly around for weeks on end while being filmed to get all these different types of shots and then build a a plot around this entire conflict. How 
how is there only like two dog fighting scenes in this hour, like in this hundred minute long movie? There's this, it, and then they break it up with ground combat sequence with fighter pilots. <laughs> We're getting slaughtered, sir. Well, they are fighter pilots. I picked this movie, and I regret it. <laughs> I liked it. I still do. It's just, I haven't seen it since, you know, 2006. I think so. the 90s, and especially 1999, holds like a special magic of all these movies that got released because we thought the world was going to end in 2000. <laughs> You know, in fairness, too, this is a great movie to put Push on as background, out. background noise and like just background just to idly watch it. Like, you know, look up to the screen every now and then like, oh, yeah, that's a cool sequence or whatever. And yeah, that's that's really all you need to actually sit and watch it. I uh, give it like the five or five and a half out of ten. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Five. It's it's not terrible. It's not it, so bad. It's like this is absolute trash. It's just like, yeah. It has a lot of problems, and it's but the it's entertaining That's, enough to pass the time. It's strictly just the writing. Um, you know, what works for writing in a video game does not work well for writing in a movie, and I can clearly see that they definitely tried, and it's for not for a lack of trying, because, I mean... The, the freaking guy that <clears throat> made the video games made this. That's his... That's that's as good as it can possibly get for getting like close to the source material. The source material is the guy writing it, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like if they hired uh, Gabe Newell to do a Half-Life movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think if... I think uh, given a better script, framework, bones, that everybody in the movie could have done a fine job. Yeah, because like, that... And it would have still been... A, it would have been a better movie, even the same cast, if... The uh, the framework was better. If this bat. was a television show or like mapped over five episodes instead of just one long one, it definitely would have done a lot better. Because you're right, the bones are there. The bones are absolutely there for a really good story. It's just like the whole pilgrim thing was dragged out for way too long and you didn't know the importance of it until it was pretty much no one cared. Yeah, what was... I mean, what... What... Was Blair really overcoming? He wasn't. He didn't really have a character flaw, right? He was just a pilgrim. A pilgrim. <laughs> he overcame genetics. He wasn't like. He only had one moment of like character flaw, really, where he like mouthed off to his CL what he thought was an inferior or a, uh, somebody below well, him. Maybe it wasn't that he so, needed that was an arc. It. Everybody else had the arc, but they finally came to it. It was a Rudolph situation. Of you're okay, ostracized yeah, they until you have that. something we need. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You hear that, Freddy? You are still perfect. <laughs> I want to see Matthew like, Lillard needed a change. Yeah, I want to see a. It's been years, like another Matthew Lillard, Freddie Prince Jr. movie. And Matthew didn't have an arc either. He was. He did. I mean, he was just reckless. He had a he, huge reckless thing, and then he was. She it, apologized to him, and he just. There wasn't like a thing where he, well, oh, I followed my after order. She or apologized, I, did he like, after she apologized, like after she was like, I need my best pilot or whatever. We don't really see him the rest of the movie. <laughs> he just got humbled really hard. He went, he went to look for the best pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I need my best pilot. I'll go find him, sir. Um, yeah, it, yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah. The script. It's all the yeah. script. Blame the script. Well, I enjoyed it. it. I mean, like this, yeah, the special effects are really good considering its time period. And I looked it up. It was actually The Matrix 2 was the first movie to have subsurface scattering in a 3D model. And that was enough that made a lot of other movies around that same time to start like, oh, we can do this too. And that's when the next special effects boom was. Oh, because was that was after like like 2002, 2003? The Agent Smith clone fight or whatever? Yeah. Is that like ray tracing? Is that an sure. is that an NFT? <laughs> Dean, none of us have modern graphic cards that can support ray tracing. If I even mention the word ray tracing, my graphics card goes up like forty <laughs> degrees. <laughs> I try to condensation on the inside. I try to PC. do that with WoW, and my computer was just like, <laughs> no, no. 
But it is your next pick, Tim. Uh, so everyone get ready for Krull. Fuck because yeah. Because I have planned out... I've never seen I've it. I've planned out all my movies. Each of my seasons will be a theme. And I have them planned out for the next five seasons. I just gotta find the one seasons. movie that's gonna dismantle Tim's choice to the point where he's gonna reconsider his whole list. <laughs> You did it three times from November all the way up to February. You're like, I'm going to change my list. I just got to find the next one. (laughs) I knew this was like halfway through this one. I really was considered like, man, I don't like this movie. You guys got to take notes. I had to do play by play of the entire scenes. I'm like, "Uh." (laughs) did any of you guys have any closing thoughts on the movie? First First time viewer of it and never playing Wing Commander, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I I I, I'm, I have it free from one of the um, EA Origin. They have like that PlayStation Store kind of thing where like if you sign up, you get a free game every month. And I do have one of the Wing Commander games, but I never bothered installing it. I might give it a try. I think the movie gets an unfair bad rap, but I think it's not because the movie is that bad it's just one of those unfortunate films that the internet has made a habit of dogpiling on as being like oh my god this is absolutely the most terrible thing i've ever seen because everybody just thinks it's funny to tack on like how terrible it is and it's like it's not good it's not bad it's just middle of the road yeah every actor in this movie are have have pulled their weight enough to the point where like i know it's is the acting bad in this yes but like is the acting bad in episode three yes is natalie portman a bad actress no is ewan mcgregor a bad actor no a lot of the big names in this it's not their fault it's just the writing and the direction that's all it is so in this case it's exactly that like this movie isn't bad a lot of the acting scenes are cringy as fuck but it's, I don't blame them for it because I know Freddie Prince Jr. can act. I know Matthew Lillard can definitely act. Saffron Burroughs is, is acting as best as I'd imagine her compared to Deep Blue Sea. So, I mean... <laughs> the two it, films it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it she it's, and I like I mentioned in the beginning, like I've always had like the childhood crush on her because of this and Deep Blue Sea. So, like, it, she clearly did something right for me. So, it's just... The special effects were there. There was nothing overly bad. It's just, I wish they had a little bit more time to work on the movie. Well, it took an hour to write. I thought it would take an hour to read. Or it came out at the wrong period of time. I think if it came out nowadays, it probably would have done a lot better. If they updated those graphics. No, keep the graphics the same. Makes Actually, the yeah, now it would be like a nostalgic to. throwback. Hell yeah. Oh, can you imagine <laughs> doing like retro hmm. special effects, but with modern technology? I think it would they work. cut to the cockpit and it's just the game. Like they're just playing the game. <laughs> but you still see the the outline of the monitor itself that they're filming off of. <laughs> <laughs> when I made my Star Wars movie, that's exactly what I did. I didn't record my TV as I was, you know, playing the game, but I used in-game footage for a lot of the cinematic for all the cinematics. It worked. But yeah. I hope they bring it back. Or like Star Citizen makes more waves once they actually progress further in. I haven't played it in like two years and I feel like nothing's changed. Yeah. Your kids are going to love it. Yeah. Grandkids. (laughs) Thanks again for coming along for the journey that was Wing Commander. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Screen Refresh or email us on your own movie memories at ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, please help us out and leave a rating or review on uh, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us. So for the other two, I'm the host. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks for Rule of Thirds. Anybody just just, just send anything. Just please. I don't want to sound desperate, but, but I'm desperate. I know there's probably thousands of podcasts out there that people listen to. But we, we like if you just say something. If you're listening to this, just say something. If you're listening to this, Nick forgot to edit it out of the episode. <laughs> Let us know. I didn't know. forget, listeners. I left it in intentionally. <laughs> the 
Think you can make it, Pilgrim? Pilgrim, you're going to need a couple of stitches. Oh, take her easy there, Pilgrim. Well, don't fret about that, Pilgrim. Well, Pilgrim, you're a persistent cuss, Pilgrim. Well, take some advice, Pilgrim. No. Pilgrim, hold it. Well, thanks for saving my life, Pilgrim. Well, cool off, Pilgrim. After you, Pilgrim. That's it, Pilgrim. Well, good luck, Pilgrim. But election day, Pilgrim. Step down, Pilgrim. Pilgrim. Pilgrim! Hey, Pilgrim! Pilgrim. Pilgrim! What is it now, Pilgrim? Think back, Pilgrim.